Hi, I am here representing a little bit of a different angle on this. I uh, um, fully love all the scientific experimentation and everything, and especially the publishing, but I'm here kind of from the maker non-specialist standpoint of uh, people that maybe don't understand all of the, such as myself, all of the different kind of really specific ways that this works as a non-specialist. And so, but I, I want to kind of just show that um, the, the data that the Smithsonian's putting out there and that some of the things that we're sharing, that other people are sharing, are still really usable by a non-specialist in our programs, um, with our audiences, with our curators that aren't doing specific research in this. So we're gonna talk about that a little. Let's see, where's the clicker? Um, so uh, I've been really kind of interested in 3D kind of from more a stand more standpoint of the um, the easy software that's out there now, the free software, the easy access to models, the um, fairly cheap uh, printers. So uh, about a year, um, oh, I, I wanted to give a little background of why this kind of fits in with uh, what, I, what I do at the Art Institute. Um, in my area, we cover collections information and digital publishing, so the website of collections, um, education technology, scholarly publishing coordination of the OSCE project, um, and then media production and services, so video production. So we also involved in the mobile apps and technology in the galleries and that kind of thing. And so I think I'll cover kind of why this has been helpful in using this in different ways throughout the museum. So about a year and a half ago, uh, I, was, I think we have Don Undine in the audience here, and he was doing a hackathon at the Met, and I was really curious about what he was doing and working with artists and how this could actually work within our museum. So, I, but I, I w needed to see it. So actually worked with, um, this, is, uh, this is Tom Burtonwood, and we, uh, who is an artist that is at the School of the Art Institute, and we just talked about how could we just do some pop-up things so that I could experience it, some of the other staff could experience what it really meant so that we could kind of think it through. And so we did a couple pop-up things. This was uh, some kids were in a summer class, and we had printers in the education center. We did some scanning in the galleries, and this is just a scanning in a backyard too, just to get a sense for what um, you know what kids were talking about. We saw this. We had a uh, class come in from the School of the Art Institute, and this is they're scanning it with just um, with just cameras, and then kind of just getting the out um, getting the output, like the the printouts of the collection, and talking about it with staff, and really doing it uh, doing it with education and just being out there so that we could kind of just think about, think this through together. And I think what um, we found was is that there, it seemed to be that there were a lot of different points in this process that were really engaging as far as what, how you could think about the collection. When you go and uh, use photogrammetry, which we've talked about, or we use 1, 2, 3D Catch in the galleries, that's a very, it's a free software from Autodesk, you know, you're looking at the object from all angles. You have to think about getting it from um, uh, getting it from all angles, from the top, the bottom, the side, and you, so the idea is that you're looking at it a little more differently, and that you're looking at it a little more closely, and that you're perhaps um, building a better relationship with that. Uh, the printing or the producing can also. So these are printed objects. So it's not necessarily embodiment of that plastic object, but seeing it come to life in a different way. And then perhaps the mashing up of that as well. This is, uh, Tom did this, this is our Mastiff from the Han, um, Han Dynasty, um, and then an ogre mask from the Tang Dynasty, and to make Ogre Puppy, which the kids really love for 2012. And this is another uh, one of his works, and Tom is actually going to be an artist in residence uh, during this next year with us. So, um, so thinking, this is another way. The scanning, you're looking at it differently, but the remixing. So if you're remixing the collection and you're turning it into something else. So this is really something, it seemed like there were a lot of points to look at, but it was a little bit anecdotal, and I, I think it was, uh, it felt like it was time to kind of take it to the next level and really figure out what it all means. So we, um, we filled out for a, an IMLS grant, which we got, and we just started, and it's about, um, it's about evalu evaluating this engagement. So we're going to be putting on a series of uh, five programs and then a capstone at the end 
They're all different programs. So one is a drop-in that we just had, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, another one is, uh, uh, is a week long with tweens that'll be next summer. We're doing a couple tours with, uh, with Alzheimer's visitors, with low sighted visitors, and uh, working some 3D into our teen labs. So as you can tell, it's got a very wide range. So the way we wanted to look at this, and uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of you to follow along and we can get some feedback from your, you as, uh, as we go, is that what we're looking at here is uh, we compiled an advisory team of everyone that's in education and in my department that's working on this so that we could kind of start talking about it together and start learning from each other and as the programs come together. We also have uh, Tom, the artist in residence, and a person from the Fab Lab, Fabia Mayas from the Fab Lab at, um, at MSI, and, um, and an evaluator. So we want to have a strong evaluation sense on this, and we want to keep it pretty open-ended, and the idea being that because we want to evaluate it entirely and per program because they're all different, we have three guiding questions that we're going to be looking at. The first primary question is, in what ways does the use of 3D scanning and printing in education programming impact visitor engagement with the collection? It's pretty much what we wanted to know, right? And then a supporting question, in what way do program characteristics affect the impact of 3D technology on visitor engagement with the collection? So this is really saying, do some of these programs work better than others? Can you really, is it really better if you do a week-long program where you're really digging in and you're going through all the scanning, the processing, the remixing? Or can you get something out of a drop-in program that someone comes in and then they leave and, and are they getting something out of that? And then in what ways does 3D differentiate this form of making from other art making experiences and the form of viewing from other art appreciation experiences? Is this just analogous to what we've been doing in museums all along, or does it actually add something? If it's analogous, is it fine to use that because it's got a wow factor, or is it actually distracting? So these are the things that we're um, testing. We had our first program November 9th, I believe, so uh, that's why my slides were a little late, um, because I want to get some pictures in there. So it was just last weekend, I guess. and. Uh, <laughs> And it was for the Diwali Family Festival. So it was a drop-in festival. Uh, we ended up with uh, different 3D programs serving about 671 um, visitors. And it's the Festival of Lights. So we have uh, Tom, uh, Tom Burton would made these uh, lights that you see on the, uh, on the table here. And we had uh, 3D printing demonstrations. We had Tom talking about art making and remixing of the collection. We had, um, we had kids posing like statues, so they would choose a pose, and we would have a screen that showed, uh, that showed them materializing as a 3D form. Now, in a, a lot of this, especially in public programs, is about thinking through managing expectations, because <laughs> not everyone's gonna get a print, right? Because uh, printing takes a long time, and if we scanned hundreds of people, uh, that's not really possible. So, what we thought through, well, what, how can we make this satisfying? So actually for this, we'd have them, we'd let it materialize on the screen and then pause before we took the next person and allowed the parent to take a picture of the screen and even kind of manipulate the model to some place where they wanted to take a picture. So, you, you know, they get to take that away, put it on Facebook, that kind of thing, and, um, you know, feel that. So we also had um, 3D printed molds where, where younger kids could put the Play-Doh in the 3D printed molds of the collection and get, um, get something out of here. This is one of our lion's uh, heads, and that was also really um, popular. So we, we don't have the data back yet on this, but like I said, we had um, 671 people that um, also either scanned in the gallery or went through uh, one of these programs. And, um, what this has also done is that I, I, I think this is really important that non-specialists can activate this in their education and their public programs, but also I think it's something that we can also then build capacity and help other parts of the museum that maybe aren't specialists as well. Oh, um, 
this is our 3D blog, um, so we'll be tracking all of this. I guess I should follow ahead. Um, so we'll be putting all of our instruments, all of our evaluation, everything up on this. This is museum3d.arctic.edu. We're gonna track everything, put all of our results, so if you wanna follow that. So we wanna take this in and actually use this kind of DIY maker kind of thing in research as well. So uh, this was a program, this is our Hinoki, Charles Ray Hinoki. It's a piece that has a very complicated uh, backstory, which I definitely think you should look into, but there's one piece off the side that you see here, the, the twig, I'm gonna call it, that we needed an exhibition copy. And the conservator was thinking, well, what are the different ways that we can do this? Do we have to fly someone uh, here from Japan to recarve it? And, um, or, but how, how can we experiment with different kinds of, um, different kinds of technology to look at this? So what we did was we uh, paired up with the school of the Art Institute and they had some high-end scanners. And again, this is not something we thought, oh, we definitely know this is the answer. It was, it, was it was a series of experiments so that we could learn something even if we didn't end up using this for, um, for the exhibition copy. So we did a scan of it and then on our maker bots in the office, we just did little versions, like three inch versions and then that's something that we internally could uh, work with the conservator and say, how does this look, does this look good, and just get an idea and kind of get bigger and bigger with things that we had in the office. And then at one point when she was happy with it, we went back to the School of the Art Institute and uh, this is actually, the, the white one that you see here is a paper, an MCOR paper um, print of it and they did that so that you could get a little more uh, detail out of it. It was beautiful, it had a good heavy feel and in the end, the uh, paper one went to the artist studio and was a reference for the carver to do the exhibition copy. And that's the actual twig right next to it, so you see the one-to-one. -one. The, uh, the MCOR could also do color, and that's, all, that's something that we'll do next. And then to take it to the next level, even though we, we don't need it, but just to kind of do a proof of concept, and I think this is something to expand within our museum, a different way of thinking. So a proof of concept could be that we take this scan that we're happy with, we take it to a four axis CNC, we carve it in Cyprus, which is what it is, and then compare it with the exhibition copy. So that's something that we'll probably also be trying, uh, trying through too. So sometimes it's not, the way we're looking at it, both in the programs and in, and in these, um, Conservation experiments, it might not be the outcome, but how, do we, how are we thinking differently when we're setting up experiments? And how does that like, help us at least incorporate this new way of thinking into, um, into the museum? So this is the uh, twig, but since we, sent the, since we sent the paper copy to Japan, uh, I wanted to bring a copy here of something. So actually on the MakerBot, we, uh, we did another version. And so this is actually a plastic version on, right, on the, right on the MakerBot, and it looks pretty good. So you can look at it too. That's another view of that. And we ended up as another part of the partnership, and I think this has come up so much, is that partnerships with different, with it, with industry, with artists, with schools, it, um, school of the Art Institute in our case has been just so important. So one thing that the school was interested in was the light fastness of that paper printer. And so we had resources at the Art Institute where we actually could test that. So then also using our conservation skills to give back to um, for that partnership. So that's what we've been up to and hopefully uh, we can uh, follow along. I'd love to hear more of your experiences, especially in the public program so that we can really advance that and know how this could be used in our galleries, with our audiences, and with non-specialists throughout our museum. Thank you.